We have discussed what is share-based payment transactions. We've identified the different types. We know when and how to recognize. And now we need to determine how to calculate, measure. Let's first have a look at our equity settled. Equity settled can either be a transaction with employees or a transaction with other parties. Equity settled transactions with employees will be measured at the fair value of the equity instruments on measurement grant aid. You will remember based on the definition that we have indicated. If this is a transaction with employees, our measurement and our grant date will be the same date. Immediately when you identify equity settled, you need to think about your journal entry. This is a transaction with employees, therefore debit our employee costs in our profit and loss and credit our share-based payment reserve in our statement of changes in equity. But how do we calculate the share-based payment reserve? If our entity enters into an agreement, remember the date of our agreement will be our measurement date, our grant date. Now I'm pretty sure that you will get frustrated with my pictures every time, but I'm also sure that you will remember when is your measurement date or grant date. We have one employee and the entity entered into an agreement to provide our employee with 100 shares at a fair value on grant date of 10 Rand. Now, when you calculate share-based payments, you need to identify your number of employees. You need to identify how many share options or when this is cash settled, your share appreciation rights, remember, cash settled. Three, you need to identify what is the value, which will be the fair value on different dates. And four, your vesting period. Now, we will look at the vesting period just now. For purposes of this example, you can ignore vesting. Number of employees is one. We have 100 shares and the value is 10 rand per share. Therefore, we will have to recognize a total amount of 1,000 Rand in our share-based payment reserve. When this is a transaction with other parties, we need to measure this at the fair value of goods or services received, and we need to measure this when the entity receives the goods or services. For example, if our other party provide to our entity a machine. We will have to debit our PPE with a machine and credit our share-based payment reserve statement of changes in equity. What value, guys? At the fair value of our machine when our entity receives the goods or services. Vesting conditions. This is extremely important. You need to ask yourself the question. Is there a vesting condition applicable? If the answer is no, this will vest immediately. If your answer is yes, you will have to recognize the expense over the vesting period. Now, let's have a look at a very basic example. You will remember that I've indicated to you that you need to use a table. Now, guys, this will make your life easy. First, you will have to identify number of employees, number of options or share appreciation rights. If there is a vesting period, what is the value to be used? And I will include my share-based payment reserve. Remember, this will be a total value. And the sixth column will be my profit and loss. And I'm going to indicate to you this just now. Now, in our example, we will first look at an example where there is a vesting condition and our vesting condition will be two years. Therefore, we have one employee that will receive 30 shares if this employee remains with the entity for the following two years. Grant date, fair value is five rand per share. Remember, yes, there is a vesting period. 
Therefore, when we calculate our share-based payment reserve, we will have to recognize this over the vesting period. And this will be for the first year times 1 over 2 years and the second year times 2 over 2 years. Okay. Therefore, guys, this scenario, yes, there is a vesting period of 2 years and you will have to recognize your expense proportionally. Now, when you look at this, your journal entry for year one will be to debit the employee expense in your profit and loss, credit your share-based payment reserve with the 75 rand. Then in year two, you will recognize exactly the same journal entry, 75 rand. Therefore, at the end of year two, your share-based payment reserve in your statement of changes in equity will have a total of 150 rand. Okay. Now, let's have a look at a scenario where there is no vesting condition. Therefore, no vesting condition and we will vest immediately. Therefore, vesting period will be Nothing, guys. There's no vesting condition. Vest immediately and our share-based payment reserve will be an amount of 150 Rand. And therefore, our journal entry will be to debit our expense and to credit our share-based payment reserve. And this will be at the end of year one. Therefore, no vesting condition and this vests immediately and we will recognize the expense and our share-based payment reserve. You will identify on the right side of your screen that I've included two small timelines. I'm going to read through the principles of RFRS2 with you and then I'm going to explain this by means of basic examples. Now you will remember that a vesting condition is either a service condition or a performance condition. And in terms of RFRS2 performance conditions will be divided into either a market condition or a non-market condition. Market condition, remember, we will look at the share price. Now let's read through the principle of a market condition. Taken into account at measurement date. Now remember, when we refer to our measurement date, you need to identify, is this a transaction with employees or with other parties? If this is with your employee, remember this will be the date when our entity and our employee enters into an agreement and this will be the grant date. When it is with other parties, when the goods or services are transferred. When there's a market condition, we need to take into account the fair value of our equity instruments on measurement date. Therefore, on our timeline, let's include that this is a transaction with employees and we include that this will be our grant date. We need to take into account the fair value of our instruments on grant date. Therefore, take, take this into account. Now let's refer back to the theory, not taken into account upon remeasurement of transactions subsequently. Now, what does this mean subsequently? Remember, subsequently will be for our periods ending. Therefore, guys, at the end of our financial year. And let's say, for example, on our timeline, this will be our subsequent year end. When we calculate our share-based payment reserve, we will not take into account the fair value of our instrument. Let's refer to our non-market condition. Not taken into account at measurement date when estimating the fair value of equity instruments. Therefore, on our timeline, on grant date, if there's a, a transaction, with an employee, we will not take into account the fair value on grant date. 
Now guys, you will understand this once we work through examples, but I want you to ensure that you know the principles. Now, but we need to take this into account upon remeasurement of transactions subsequently. Therefore, at the end of our financial year, our subsequent measurement, we have to take into account our fair value of the financial instrument. Now, guys, where will you apply this? When you include your table, remember your table will have your number of employees. You will include your number of shares or options. You will include your vesting period, if there is any. And number four, you will include your price, your fair value. And then you need to remember for each year, on your left hand side, you need to include your years, one, two, three, and so forth. Now, where will you apply this? When you include your year and you need to include the price that you need to use to calculate your share based payment reserve. IFRS 2 indicates to us that vesting periods can either be fixed or variable. Now, when it is fixed, you will use a fixed number of years to calculate your share based payment reserve. When it is variable, you need to look at the performance condition and you will recognize journal entries until the performance condition are satisfied. Now, extremely important when you look at variable vesting conditions. An initial estimate of the length should be made at grant date based on the most likely outcome of a performance condition. Now guys, this is important. Let's just quickly think about this section. If, for example, you are now at the end of year one, you need to recognize your share-based payment reserve because you do not know what is the actual details for year one. Remember, this is not finalized yet. But you are at the end, I know. But it can be, for example, that you have not yet closed your systems and so forth. Guys, this is a very basic example though, hey? Okay, so you do not know this. Therefore, you will have to use the most likely outcome. And in some instances, this will be estimates that you need to use. Okay, why? You do not yet have your actuals. Then remember, when we look at performance conditions being a market condition, you will not revise your journals, guys. Why not? Now, what does it mean not to revise? You will not go back into your previous years because you have recognized this based on actuals. What is a market condition? Remember, a market condition, we will have to look at our actual share price. Therefore, this is actuals, final. You will not revise. But when we refer to performance conditions, that is not a market condition. You will have to revise this. Why? Because first, you had to use, most probably, estimates because you did not have actuals. Then year two, once you have actuals, you need to use the actual details. 